when the pressure is so high and you have to keep growing and growing and growing, end up in, in tough situations. What I know now, growth is important, but it is only one measure. And the most important and best way to grow is through your existing customers. Take every ounce of energy on what you're throwing into trying to cold call or whatever and try to make your product better and try to get your existing customers to refer people because one happy customer will get you everywhere and if you're really good and have a powerful acquisition machine that brings people in but as soon as they're in they're out you've done yourself nothing especially by the way if you're looking in the next five years because capital will be scarce most venture capitalists are not funding companies right now Hey, welcome to Sit Down Startup Founder Podcast. I'm your host, Adam O'Donnell, former founder and VC. I now work at Zendesk for Startups, where we offer six months free use of Zendesk for qualified high growth companies. That was Howard Lerman, the founder of Yext, publicly traded company, currently working on a cool company called Rome. If you've been listening to this podcast for any time, you know that we do not push Zendesk. That was an authentic response that he gave after years and years of building one of the fastest growing startups and one of the largest tech companies in the world. Focus on your customer. I'm, I, we're not saying that to make you buy Zendesk, but it is just true, and especially in an environment like this, get the referrals from your existing customers. That's where you win. That's how you grow in 2023. Howard unpacks all of this. You're going to love it. If you're a founder and you're planning on raising money or have already raised money, you're going to get something from this episode. Boom. Howard, it is a pleasure to have you on Sit Down Startup. Man, I, I cannot wait to hear your story. You founded an iconic company with Yex and you're currently building Rome, which you have claimed on LinkedIn is going to be even bigger. Cannot wait to dive in. But would you first tell me when you founded Yex, was it doing the same thing that it is when you left? Not even close. When we founded Yex, the original idea was to build kind of a hotels.com for gyms. Think about you know, today you have class pass, things like that. Our original idea in 2006 was to build a website where people could, a consumer facing site where people could find the nearest gym and request a free trial pass, turn around and sell the lead to the gym. So Yak started out as a B2C internet company and turned into a B2B enterprise SaaS company. Very interesting. And how big was it when you left? If you wanted to show like market cap or employees, anything like that for anyone who doesn't well, know? When I stepped back in March, which was now, I guess, I think of things in terms of quarters. Uh, so I've had three quarters now with no, uh, without having to do an earnings call. The company, I think, did about a hundred million of revenue in the quarter right before I left. So you could think of it as a $400 million SaaS business at that time. That is incredible, man. What what a story. I want to dive into some of the earlier growth strategies that you did, you know, before that hockey stick moment. But before that, I've been wanting to add some more color to this because when I was a founder, just the emotional journey of up and down is so much. And I and I know there's a lot of people who are listening who maybe who just hear about the IPO, they hear about the hundred million and a quarter, and it feels unrelatable. But it, is there maybe a time where you could think of like one of the lowest points kind of emotionally? in your journey of founding Yex that you could like take us into maybe failure after failure or something like that, that could kind of share about what that moment was like. Well, Adam, I think you're right that it is unrelatable when you're talking about a public company on CNBC that did a hundred million and a quarter to the journey of a founder who's just trying to make something happen. And frankly, I identify a lot more with the latter than the former, which is why I'm trying to do it all over again. There are so many ups and downs. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a roller coaster. And I think maybe one thing I've really learned is just how important expectations management is. And, you know, if you think about delight or customer delight, it's kind of the difference between what people think they're going to get and what they actually get. So if you're going to give out a certain absolute number and people are expecting it to be lower than you've delighted them. If they're expecting it to be higher, then you've disappointed them. As a founder, when you're starting a company, it's your job to create a lot of hype. You are running around telling everybody that things are awesome. You are crushing it. And frankly, in many cases, you are living a lie. You are externally promoting your business, but internally you have not solved the things that that you want to solve. Uh, and so this is where things can get really down for people. And I'll 
tell you one story in 2009 yext raised in september a 25 million dollar now this sounds like a small number today but in 2009 uh this was a really big round and we raised 25 million from a leading growth stage investor for our original internet paper call business model and a couple months after that Google came calling. They came knocking on the door and they said, we want to buy your business. And they threw, you know, all the execs came by and they threw a term sheet at us and we signed the term sheet and they started to do their diligence. And months in, uh, after we thought we had sort of like a deal to sell the company, they pretty much walked. And they... I just got a call from, you know, their head of corporate. Hey, you know, we just had a meeting and uh, we're just, we're not going to be moving forward at this time. And that was the lowest moment. It was August 6, 2010. And it wasn't because the company was like going to do badly or was doing badly. It was just because the expectations were for everyone to hit a certain thing. And we now had to completely sort of, we had, we had in our mind, and set this certain course, which which was no longer an option. And that was frankly devastating. You know, we were under a term sheet for months. It changed the way we were running the company. Rumors were out. People kind of figured something was going on. And you had to pretty much reboot everything and start all over again. Mm. Man, that is brutal. I really appreciate you sharing that. Well, what was September of 2010 like in terms of what what were some of the biggest things that you did in that moment to to bring the morale out because i can only imagine you you basically said hey we got the company you probably in your mind thought about what you're going to do with the money personally and and now it's completely different how did you change the momentum well you know we repivoted the entire company and i think one thing i've also learned is that the best performers the best executors the best whether you're an actor, a politician, an executive, a startup founder, the best people are really good at performing at a B level when they feel like a D or an F. Wow. Most people can show up and be an A. They can, you know, if you're feeling great, you can come up, you can kick out. The thing that's really a big separator is whether you're an athlete or whatever, you can still perform pretty well, even if you feel like it. And I think during that time, our team, my team felt like for that quarter or two, and somehow we were able to still perform at a B level during a period in which you felt inside like an F. That is huge. It's about continuing one foot after the other and recognizing, hey, we're not going to be able to A level right now, like, like being realistic with yourself, but still being able to do good enough. Man, Howard, that that is powerful. I, the the next kind of phase of this is I I want people to know like based on what you just said, it's really relatable. Like we understand like you go through ups and downs, everyone does. But then also there's some things that you know in your head that not everyone knows, and I think some of that is around like growth strategies that have yeah. worked. And yeah. so is is there one you wanted to dive into in the early days of Yex, maybe pre hockey stick moment that we could kind of pull apart and learn from? You know, over the past twenty years, and I realize I sound like kind of an old guy talking like this, but the fact is I pretty much been doing this since 2001. The things that used to work, they change over time. The tactics change. And it's it's a little bit cat and mouse because the minute you sort of tap into something that seems to be working, everyone jumps right into it. And the thing is that, you know, let's talk about growth for consumer for a second. Consumer, if you're starting a consumer company and you know, depending on your business model, it largely is kind of luck, frankly. You know, it either is going to generally take off or it will not take off. And, you know, and I built a company called Confide, which is a mobile messaging app that did experience that takeoff in 2014. And a bunch of other stuff I tried didn't. And I can't work, you can't work backwards to figure out what's going to take off and what's not going to take off. It's Frankly, just some some bit of randomness, some bit of is it a meme? Does it hit the does it hit right now? Does it hit critical mass? There's a lot of luck in starting a consumer app. On the enterprise side, which maybe is what you were asking, you can control your destiny a lot more because you can have a one-on-one conversation with someone 
And when you have a one on one conversation with someone, you get signal back, you get information back in real time. So you can see, is my customer listening to me? Is the prospect listening to me? Am I able to, you know, what are the things that I'm saying that are hitting them? What are the involuntary facial cues that, you know, when I say something, does it come back at the same time when I, you know, pitch them on a product? Are they, are they going to buy it? Are they going to put their money where their mouth is? So you get really good signal on the enterprise side, which you really don't get except in mass on the consumer side. So there's no single magic bullet to growth except to pretty much try everything. But frankly, I've learned the most important thing is to not over-index on growth at all. And I think in the past cycle of companies, venture capitalists and late-stage growth investors have absolutely distorted what a company ought to be and how fast the company ought to grow in order to keep marking up their funds and funds and funds and put enormous unnatural pressure on founders to deliver growth that exceeded expectations. And that's why you end up with things like FTX. When when the pressure is so high and you have to keep growing, 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 you know, who knows what really went on in there, but you end up in, in tough situations. And so what I what I know now is growth is important, but it is only one measure. And the most important and best way to grow is through your existing customers mm. and take every ounce of energy on what you're throwing into, you know, trying to cold call or whatever, and try to make your product better and try to get your existing customers to refer people because one happy customer will get you everywhere. And if you're really good and have a powerful acquisition machine that brings people in, but as soon as they're in, they're out. You've done yourself nothing. Build something, especially, by the way, if you're looking in the next five years, because capital will be scarce. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, I mean, most venture capitalists are not funding companies right now. So you got to figure out ways to grow without doing expensive paid advertising. You need to make sure that, you know, your existing customers are driving your existing referrals. I also think in a period like this, and again, this is B2B, not B2C talking for a second, you know, price matters a ton. You're going to have a lot of really cost conscious buyers. Every CFO is opening up their budget and thinking, how can I cut 15% from this year's, you know, SaaS budget? I have too many tools, too many products. I want to take them all down. So, you know, I think vendor consolidation is a the theme. Benny, Mark Benioff just talked about that in his quarterly earnings report. Look at the era we live in. I mean, Salesforce, the bellwether of all SaaS companies, just declined to issue guidance for the year. I mean, that is in the first time in 21 years that they looked out and they said, hey, we can't issue guidance. And, you know, and then you see Stuart and Brett stepping down. And so, I, I mean, these are all just kind of signals. It's going to be a tough three, four or five years. You know, if you mentally can can decide that ahead of time and be like, yeah, this is going to suck for three years, that might make it easier along the way. And by the way, the good news for every founder out there is you are not going to have some late stage VC or late stage fund with billions of dollars when you have a million bucks of ARR chasing you and throwing a billion dollar valuation on your head. You don't have to worry about that anymore. And in some ways, I hope that is a relief because that is the natural order of the world. That is the natural order of business. And it will make your company better as a consequence. Mm. Man, preach. <laughs> I love this. It's going back to basics. And like we we had some huge distortions over the past few years for a lot of different reasons, starting with just the Fed pouring all the money in throughout throughout the United States and then of course the globe. So that's gonna transcend into business and it's it's had a lot of repercussions that are not great. Um, but I love just like the focus on the the basics of what makes a good business. And if you it's acquire a customer, keep that customer and get that customer to talk about go tell their friends. It's really make, simple. Cu make customers love you. That I mean, and I have to say for everyone who's listening, I do not make people talk about certain topics on the Zendesk uh, sit down startup podcast. This is like completely authentic, but like that is one of, that is like our, that's what we do at Zendesk is we help you be able to make your customers champions uh, and, and love you. And that it just helped me with that strategy. So if we just said like, okay, growth is not, it's not end all be all growth. It's the right kind of growth. And that's primarily through the channel of your current customer. Are there any tactics that you've seen work, maybe even now at Rome, 
uh, which would love to get a side note of what, what you're building there, as well as maybe some strategies for growth that you've seen that have worked while focusing on your customer. Well, you know, I was running a 1500 person company when the pandemic struck, we had people around the world. We had people in Berlin, we had people in Beijing, we had people in Tokyo, we had a big HQ in New York with a thousand people. Yes, was always a in-office culture company and everyone had that fast connectivity, the ad hoc impromptu meetings, the that that energy of electric energy of being together all in one room, all charging towards the same mission. And then it was gone. And we went to Zoom and Slack like everybody else. And those things kept us linked, but didn't bring us together. And frankly, I really think we lost something when that happened. Uh, we lost some parts of our culture. We lost some parts of our performance management. We lost you know, things that used to take two people five minutes to get done right now ended up being scheduled for Zoom meetings next week for an hour with 12 people. And everyone's calendars filled up. Everything became super intentional. Uh, it was endless, you know, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And so pretty much I was just like, wait a minute, this is not how I used to operate pre-pandemic where, you know, you're in the office, people are talking to you for two minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 30 seconds here, pulling together groups, seeing who's talking to who, huge visibility. And one day I was setting up a Zoom with 80 people. And, you know, when you're running a big company, you have these awful Zooms with 80 people where nobody's listening. And unless it's like about a layoff or something, and then everyone's listening. But then, <laughs> but nobody's listening. And by the way, I never laid a single person off at Yext. And I told everyone I would not lay a single person off at Yext. Uh, that's another story. That was a huge mistake. Let me just say, though, back to this story, you, you're adding people to the Zoom, and then I forgot to add someone. And I realized that if you forget to add someone to a Zoom, they don't exist. And so that inspired this idea of, well, wait a minute, what if, what if everyone could see all the meetings going on in the company at the same time, bird's eye view, and people could move freely between them? And that inspired the Rome map. And so we position Rome as a cloud HQ, we call it. Your cloud HQ, your all in one cloud headquarters for distributed teams that makes companies more productive by reducing meeting times, that makes them feel more connected by bringing people together and let them working together without meeting and saves them money within our all in one cost savings bundle. And to your point about how do we stay close to our customers, you know, Zendesk is a tremendous uh, tool. I know so many companies use Zendesk, Yex use Zendesk. Uh, Slack uses Zendesk. They're a huge Zendesk house. Um, being able to stay close to your customers uh, is one of the most important things. What's funny is Slack and Zendesk are a bit on a collision course now because everyone's doing customer support in Slack, which I think is pretty freaking cool. Uh, and, you know, we've built some of those features into Rome. You know, we, I think for, for sort of more formal ticketing stuff, that, then you're going to still want to use systems like Zendesk. But you know, we have some features in Rome and we don't, we're not, we're offering a cloud headquarters, but to support our own customers, frankly, we just show up to their cloud HQ live, which is kind of a cool thing. If you imagine, and maybe you'll remember the geek squad from Best Buy, you know, you call them and they show up. That's what we do. Uh, so, you know, if we can, you know, these systems are awesome and powerful and help you scale, but there's nothing more powerful than that one-on-one -on -one face to face. And if you can do that, that's the best way to stay close to your customers. That's amazing. I remember because I checked out your your map. I got to do a um, a product demo and was just blown away by just like the feeling of like I'm in the office. I, I saw you on other parts of the building, the the map when I was in your office and I was like, oh my gosh. And I saw who you were talking to. I saw when you were talking, but yet in the same way that I would like look into a room and see you in that room, but I'm not going to go interrupt you necessarily. And I was having my conversation. It was, it was amazing, but I love the support piece of like, if I have any question, like someone from your team just like basically walks into there and says, Hey, like what, what's the deal? You okay? Like how can we That's help right. you? That's right. You can pop right over and live troubleshoot. And it's, it's really neat. I think in, in anybody's company, they should try to be as again, B2B try to be as close to your customers as possible. But there's a corollary to that, which is you absolutely want to listen to what your customers' problems are, but you absolutely do not want to implement their solutions. Customers are very good at telling you their problems. They're not as good at telling you the solution because they don't have the context of your product. And only you as the founder or visionary can string it all together 
and figure out how to solve their problem in a way that's consistent with the way you want to set up your company. That is gold. You listen for the ultimate thing that they're trying to solve for. Like in the same way, like that, that famous uh, quote that if Henry Ford had asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. And he's like, I understand what you're saying. You want to get to your place from A to B faster. I'm going to, I'm going to, as a founder is going to, I'm going to suggest the best solution on where you're ultimately trying to go. Correct. Boom. Howard, this has been amazing. What's the best way to reach out to you? Is it Twitter or LinkedIn? Well, you can always find me on Twitter at, at Howard. I was an early user. You can find us uh, on Rome at Twitter at, at Rome. My email, you can always find me is h at ro dot am. So I, you can email me. That's even better than LinkedIn because I don't really check my LinkedIn that often. And Howard, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Great to see you, Adam. Thank you. And thank you, Zendesk. You guys are a tremendous company. And I swear that was not a paid plug. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and Google. If you want to learn more about Zendesk for Startups and our free offer, please check out our website at zendesk.com slash startups. 